Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to night number 19 of Revelation Today, The Great Reset. We are so glad to see those of you here who are live with us in Chattanooga, and as well as those of you who are joining us online. It has been quite an adventure. We're not quite finished yet. We're in the last few nights of our meetings, but we are just so glad that we can come together and study the Word of God once again. Tonight, we're going to be studying the Holy Spirit, a very exciting topic, one that a lot of people have questions about. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? What is the unpardonable sin? How does the Spirit help me and strengthen me in the Christian life? We are going to learn that and much, much more. So thank you for joining us one more time. We want to encourage those of you that are watching online from all around the world to go to the website, revelationtoday.com, where you get those resources. And please do finish and go through all of those Bible study guides on there. They will help you immensely. You will learn your Bible better in a few weeks than you have your entire life as you watch this series and go through those lessons. Also, be sure to download those free PDFs. You will not want to miss a single thing. You're going to gain all kinds of understanding about the Bible that maybe you have never had before. So be sure to do that. Also, we encourage you to share the website with others. That website will be available. The, all of the studies and all of the videos will be archived on the website. So please do continue to share that with your friends and your family so that they can also gain the blessing of these studies. We also encourage you to go back and watch the videos again. You know, sometimes you watch it the first time and you miss stuff. Go back, watch it again, do the lessons, and you will be highly, highly blessed. You can't go through them enough. Also, you want, we want to encourage you to visit itiswritten.tv where there is a number of programs on health and the Bible and Bible prophecy and a number of topics to help you study more deeply. If you have children, we recommend you to go to myplacewithjesus.com where there is a number of resources there for children. Well, as we've studied night by night, and those of you who have joined us around the world, Pastor John has been making a number of invitations for baptism and to be a part of God's end time remnant church. And we want to encourage you to make your decision for Jesus. Fill out those decision cards on the program, check in with your local church, and be sure to uh, heed the, vo the, Spirit, uh, the voice of the Holy Spirit as he is leading you night by night. We want to truly, truly appeal to you to make your decisions for Jesus. Well, we also have local friends that will be coming and uh, giving you phone calls or reaching out to you in some way. We highly encourage you to uh, follow up with them. They will be offering different types of study programs and things in their local area that you will be able to join in. Well, at this time, I'm going to invite Pastor John to come on out. We're going to have some Bible questions, and we have some good ones tonight. And by the time we finish the series, we will have answered over 100 Bible questions, Pastor John. Is that right? It's amazing. Well, thanks for submitting the questions. Good evening, everyone. Great to see you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for being here, too, Thank Wes. Thank you. Glad to be here. Let's dive into the questions. All right. Our first question is, how many times can a person be baptized? I understand that you don't just jump in the water every time you sin, but I've sinned greatly and have been baptized twice already. Is it appropriate to be baptized more than once or twice? It is not inappropriate based on what we read in the Bible. The Bible says in Acts chapter 19 that there were certain disciples who'd been baptized, but they entered into a significantly new experience with God based on the new knowledge they gained. And so therefore, it's not inappropriate when you learn new things. And I don't mean some little scrap of information, but particularly if it is experience-altering, life-changing new light. That's not inappropriate. Another time a person may choose to be rebaptized uh, is if they have wandered far from God and left God, and now they're coming back to God. It's a little like if a couple were divorced and then were the thing for one of them to, to, to get into another very serious relationship. I mean, remarriage is appropriate. So if you think about it like that, what's the limit? Look, I don't know. There's no limit given us in the Bible. We have examples of people being rebaptized, but we don't have examples of people being re-rebaptized, but that's not to say it didn't happen. So I would encourage you to make this a matter of prayer, perhaps counsel with somebody of experience in these areas. Talk to God, follow his direction. He never has yet let anyone astray. Amen. 
Number two, I have a friend who says some negative things about what I've been learning at Revelation Day, the Great Reset, saying these are different from mainstream Christianity. It doesn't seem to me to be the case, so I wonder why are they saying it? Yeah, I wonder too. I don't think it's especially unusual when you learn something new for counselors to come out of the closet and advise you otherwise, and thank God for them. Because let's say you learned something new and it wasn't true. Maybe it was flat out dangerous. You would want somebody to come alongside you and point out the error of your ways. Now, if you're in a Bible study series like this and you're learning something new and your friend says something negative about what you're learning at Revelation today, of course, your question would then be, would you show me that in the Bible? Maybe they're going to show you something right. I mean, thank God if I'm telling you something wrong, if here at Revelation today, the great reset, we're claiming that something is so and it's not, then you want somebody to tell you. Now, at the same time, what if what you're learning in your experience is right? Who is it, do you think, who wants to talk you out of that? No question, that's the devil. Now, why would somebody do that? I think that's the question. Why is somebody saying that? I don't know. Is it, is it fear? Is it ignorance? Is it, is it, I don't know, they, they worry they're going to lose some influence over you? I, I, I don't know. I cannot tell you why people say the things they say, although that old saying is people are down on what they're not up on. So maybe you could share the Bible studies with that person. Perhaps you could share links to these presentations or, or video recordings of these presentations and then say, get back to me with your list of questions after each one. Naysayers have it easy. All you got to do is be critical. But uh, if this isn't mainstream enough for your friend, Jesus is the divine son of God, died for your sins. They laid him in the grave. He was resurrected the third day, went to heaven. He intercedes for you at God's right hand. I don't think I'm out of the mainstream right now. And by, listen, I don't care to be in the mainstream. I just care to be in the stream that Jesus is in. That's all. That's all. I've shared things from the Bible, and, I've said, and people have said, do you not know that these people believe what you just taught last night or, or some such thing? I, I, lucky for them. God bless them. It wouldn't matter to me if Mickey Mouse taught what I was teaching here. I would say, how about that? Mickey Mouse is right. You know, even a broken watch is, is right twice a day. So it doesn't matter to me if you've got some strange group of folks or some strange individuals agreeing that's okay. So we're not trying to appeal to the masses. We're not trying to be, this is not a popularity contest. This is proclaiming the word of God. So when you look into the Bible, the fact isn't who believes this. I mean, they asked that in Jesus' day. Which of the leaders believe in him? If your criteria for what is right is, did Billy Graham believe this? Or does this TV preacher believe this? Wrong criteria. Let's not say, who agrees? Let's just say, does the Bible agree? And if the Bible agrees, then you are standing on solid rock. Just stand there. Don't let anybody talk you out of your experience with God. It seems the Pharisees called Jesus a drunkard and a wine bever, so and a glutton. So that doesn't necessarily mean they're right. It seems that God used many denominations through the Protestant Reformation to restore truth lost during the Dark Ages. That seems to be the climax with the remnant church in the last days before Jesus comes. All the truth will be found in one place. Am I on the right track with this? Absolutely on the right track. Proverbs 4 verse 18 says, The path of the just is as the shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. Now, take the early Christian church. They had light and all of it. Jesus gave them the keys to the car. He said, here's the truth. You've got the scriptures. I've been with you three and a half years. Now go and share this with the world. Over time, as was predicted by Paul, prophesied in the Bible, uh, grievous wolves came in, not sparing the flock. The man of sin came, brought terrible, terrible deceptions. The church, which had been basking in bright light, was now in abject darkness. But God did not leave the church in abject darkness. What God did was he raised up people with light, people like Wycliffe early on, and then Huss, the Bohemian, or the Czech reformer. And then people like Martin Luther and Calvin. Calvin wasn't right about everything. This idea that some are predestined to be saved and others are damned to be lost and there's nothing you can do about it. He was wrong about that, flat out wrong. But he was right about a lot of stuff. Ulrich Zwingli was another one. We need to be careful we don't make superheroes out of these people. Ulrich Zwingli, there was a fellow named Felix Mainz who was in Zurich and he was baptizing by immersion. He was an Anabaptist. 
And the church leaders in Zurich said that he should be put to death for baptizing people by immersion. And Ulrich Zwingli, whose name I have already mentioned in Revelation today, a giant in the Protestant Reformation, agreed that Mainz should be executed for baptizing by immersion. So Zwingli went right about everything. And then came the Anabaptists teaching baptism by immersion. And John Wesley added a little more, and John Knox added a little more, but there's still some pieces missing. The second coming of Jesus was not being proclaimed. The seven-day Sabbath hadn't been proclaimed. Now the missing pieces are being put back into the puzzle. The light is shining more and more and brighter and brighter so that when Jesus comes back, he has a people that are walking in all the light they can possibly find in the Word of God. And that's where I want to be, and that's where I think you want to be. It's where I would like you to be. It's where God wants you to be. This is why sometimes you say, well, I've been living my little old Christian faith for 20, 40, 60 years. Why change now? Because God wants you to walk in the light. You're happier in the light. You're honoring God more in the light. He wants your example to those around to be walk in the light. So the questioner was absolutely right on. The light is shining brighter and brighter and brighter, and the role of God's church in the last days is to let as much light as possible. I want to say all of the light, but you see, I don't want any human to make that claim. To let all the light that we can find and know and discern to shine brightly in the last days, to encourage the people to walk in that light so they are ready to meet Jesus when he comes back. Amen. Is it necessary for every believer to speak in tongues and pray in the Spirit? Oh, have mercy, no. Well, to pray in the Spirit, yes. It's necessary for every believer to pray in the Spirit. No question about that. Well, let's consider this business of, of speaking in tongues. Uh, Acts chapter 2, that's where we're going to go. You know, you may like to take a seat. Yeah, this it's could a long take one. a while. It's going to take a while. This could take a while. I'll uh, do my very best not to take too terribly long. Book of Acts, chapter 2, that's where we see the gift of tongues first demonstrated. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with one accord in one place. Holy Spirit came, cloven tongues like as of fire above them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I want to be very careful that you don't think I'm belittling anybody. I'm not. I prayed and prayed that God would give me the gift of tongues. Uh, I had people pray for me. I had people lay their hands on me, praying that I would get the gift of tongues. I never did get the gift of tongues, not, not the sort we're going to talk about tonight. Never got it. But I, I wanted the gift of tongues. I had many dear friends. I went to churches where people spoke in tongues. And I'm talking about the commonly understood version. Here they began to speak with other tongues. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. If you go down the list, there's lots of different places, countries that these Jew, Jewish believers came from. They were all amazed. Oh, oh, verse 6. When this was noised abroad, you've got to love that, noised abroad. The multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. So, they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Verse 11, we hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. They've given you the answer to this. It says languages. Languages from whence we came. Languages of our own country. When they spoke in other tongues, this one is helpful to understand old English. You know, my friend Jose, his mother tongue is, I'll give you a guess, it's Spanish, that's right. Now, I could say my friend Enrique, and you're going to say Spanish, but he was born and raised in the United States by English-speaking parents. His mother tongue is English. But if you have a, 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 a German friend named Helmut or Ingrid, their mother tongue is likely going to be what? German. That's right. That's right. French for someone named something French and, and so on. Your mother tongue. See? So they were hearing in their mother tongue. They weren't hearing, I, I, I hate to use this word because it sounds disparaging. 
They weren't hearing gibberish. They weren't hearing um, unintelligible sounds. They were hearing languages. And so when you get over further into the Bible, you know the only church they write to about the gift of tongues is the Corinthian church. Corinth was a busy port. There were people from all over the place going, coming in and out of Corinth. You can expect there to be a lot of languages taught. So it says in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, and th there's so much to read. Mm. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Differences of administrations, but the same Lord. Diversities of operations, but it's the same God which works in all. The manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all, everyone. So the gift you get, and people do receive spiritual gifts. You need to be aware of that. Those gifts are for everyone's benefit. People will tell you, I speak in tongues so that me and God communicate. Well, but that's not the purpose of the gift of the Spirit. Gift of the Spirit is so that everybody's benefited and edified. And by the way, let's just be honest. A fellow I met in Australia told me he got in his car in Sydney, drove to Melbourne, it's 10 or 11 hours, spoken tongues with God all the way. That's a long time. I said, what do you talk to God about? He said, I don't know. I was speaking in the spirit. Let's get real. What good is that? Now, some, someone's going to say, well, God knows and you're blessed. No, that's not what the Bible says. I want to appeal to you to be biblical about this. What's fascinating about this is the gift of tongues is, is, is a real phenomenon as practiced in many modern churches today. Something happens. And so people see it and say, well, it must be the Bible. Well, no, no more than Sunday is the Bible or grandma in heaven is the Bible. It's an erroneous teaching. For to one is given by the spirit, the word of wisdom, another knowledge, another faith, another healing, another miracles, prophecies, discernment, tongues, interpretation. Notice what it says. But all these work that one and the self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. God decides what spiritual gift you get. You don't. And the minister of your congregation doesn't either. No one can tell you that you must have the gift of tongues. God will tell you you must have the Holy Spirit. He will decide what gift you get. I met a wonderful lady one day this was in the state of kentucky and she said yeah i go to church but i'm i'm not saved i said wow that's too bad you you, you look saved you, you you act saved i said do you love god oh yeah no question you gave your heart to jesus 100 percent. well then you're saved no wow that's got a, what a bummer that is to to have earnestly love god and have no assurance of salvation i said why she said well i don't speak in tongues I said, and so in spite of the fact that you love God, you know God loves you, you've repented and he's forgiven you. You're not saved. That's what you're telling me. 100% not saved. No. That's a, that's a, I hate to say this, but that's a cultish belief. That's a cult-like belief. It's not biblical. And you're telling someone you can only be saved if X, and it's unbiblical. That's dangerous, man. I'd run from that. And it's not true. God decides what spiritual gift you get. If you get the gift of teaching, hallelujah. You know, no one ever brags about, well, God gave me the gift of helps. That's just as much a gift of the Spirit as is working miracles. It's a gift of the Spirit. It's right in the Bible. No one bragging about that. Because everybody want to raise the dead. Everybody wants to speak in tongues. You don't get as many people looking at you and praising you if you're just helping in the kitchen. Church can be a funny place. The Bible goes on to say that if anybody speaks in tongues, is interesting. It says, let it be two or at the most by three and let one interpret. So if the gift of tongues is an operation, you don't have a whole church full of people doing it at the same time. Two or three, and there must be someone to interpret. I'll give you an example of that. Let's say a busload of Italian tourists stopped in the parking lot 
And their tour guide said, tonight, here in America, we're going to take you to a Revelation Today meeting, the highlight of your stay in the United States. Well, we'd have a little problem because these Italians who arrived, none of them speak English. And apart from pizza and Lamborghini, Maserati, Roma, I don't speak any Italian. And by the way, Spanish speakers love to run around telling people you're going to speak Spanish in heaven. Not happening. It's either English with a New Zealand accent or Italian. What a beautiful language. Now, I cannot give you a Bible verse for that. I just, I need to make that clear. So, if God were to see it needful, the gift of tongues would operate like this. Myself, or maybe Wes, or maybe you, would be given the gift of speaking in tongues. You would have the miraculous capacity to speak Italian. So that you then could proclaim the gospel to the busload of Italian tourists who arrived. It didn't have to be a busload, could be one or two, but you get my point. The gift in tongues would enable somebody to speak a language that he or she has not studied or prepared for. That's why it's miraculous. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the gift of tongues. And then, by the way, if it were done really biblically, while somebody is speaking Italian who's never studied Italian in his or her life, somebody else would be interpreting for the rest of the church. That's the gift of tongues. So the, 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 the so-called gift of tongues where people, and again, it's hard to know what right word to use because I don't want to sound disparaging, but where people speak something unintelligible, uh, it might turn you on, it might excite you, it might be spectacular, you might like it, it might, it might make people clap and cheer, but it isn't biblical. So I'd encourage you to be biblical. Okay, John, have you heard of people getting this miraculous ability to speak other languages, to, to communicate the gospel? I surely have. I could tell you two or three or four or five stories like that. Does it happen every day? Well, no, there are reasons for that. There are reasons for that. The gospel is, frequent, is spoken in most languages now, most, not every. And when you can say to Siri, hey, what's the word for this? Translate that phrase. There are, there are less occasions now where it's needful. But it's still needful. That's why it still happens. My hunch is, understand now, I've moved out of saying the Bible says, my belief is that as we get closer to the return of Jesus, you'll see the biblical gift of tongues manifest more and more. Because while I said most languages uh, are spoken by people communicating the gospel, not all. There are many languages where there's no one to communicate the gospel. Uh, by the way, uh, it is written as translating our own programming into a Maya language spoken in Guatemala by several hundred thousand people. First time ever any Christian programming is in this Maya language. What a big deal. But I believe with all of the languages still to be reached, we'll see the gift of tongues, the genuine gift of tongues manifest. So, understand. Gift of tongues is the gift of speaking other languages. It's not babbling. It's not gibberish. It's not something no one understands. There's always an interpreter. It's for the purpose of sharing the gospel. I want to encourage you to stand on the Bible when it comes to this. Amen. You want to hold our last question till tomorrow night? Yeah, let's go for it. Do it. All right. Oh, let's yeah. do it. Last one. What does the Bible say about jewelry? I've always heard conflicting opinions about it. Okay. I said we'd do it, so we'll do so it. So have a long one. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, we're in now. We're in now. You know what the Bible says? The Bible speaks about jewelry several times, and so you will find that some Christians take that to mean they shouldn't wear jewelry, and I, I have no argument with that. The Bible says, speaking in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, speaking to women, and of course this would apply to women or men, whose adorning... Let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair, wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel. And someone says, can't plait my hair? No, no, no. This was a custom back there. The word used is plaiting, but it was a way of... These were, these were hairstyles just for show. It was, uh, you remember Carmen Miranda, uh, something like that. 
These were big old hairstyles that were decorated and it was, it was just a very self-centered, showy sort of a thing. So that's what that's saying. But let it be not the gold or the fancy clothing, the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great prize. And so that's what Peter had to say, and he was very clear about that. And if you were to read where Paul wrote to Timothy, you would find much the same counsel, and perhaps we'll share that tomorrow night because I don't want to take up too much time. The principle is this. Decorate one's spirit, one's heart, not outward decoration because, uh, look, the, the fact is what you're doing there is that's about attracting attention to yourself or saying, now I look pretty or better or cooler or prettier or some such thing. I wouldn't make this the unpardonable sin, and I would encourage you not to be judgmental, but if you're looking at yourself, I'd encourage you to look into the Bible. This is one of these growth areas where you can say, I want to stand where the Bible stands. This is not the only place. There are other places as well. Uh, look at the churches portrayed in Revelation. Revelation 12, God's church, no artificial decoration. Revelation 17, all kinds of adornment. So I'd encourage you to stand where the Bible stands. Study this. I appreciate the question. It's a good question. We want to be as biblical as we possibly can be in our relationship with God and do all we can to be sure we are pleasing God, even if it's not our first choice. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John. Appreciate those Bible answers. At this time, we're going to have a special number by our It Is Written musicians, Claudia and Roy Trayer, entitled, The Power of the Cross.
Well, that was beautiful. Thank you very much, Claudia and Roy. Good evening again, everyone. Still there? All right. You know, we're, we're in the home straight now. We're just about done. We have uh, three presentations left in Revelation today, the Great Reset. And my hope and prayer is that each one of us can experience a, a reset, a renewal, a rebirth, a transformation. As we open the Bible now, let's pray that God would, would, would work that further in our lives right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you grateful. Our hands are stretched out to you. We are praying, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit. Guide us where we need information. Grant us that. Where we need surrender. Allow us to experience that. Where we need recreation. Please do that work in our lives. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Please say with me, amen. They're tragic stories. Unfortunately, they're, they're, they're not uncommon. Children hurt or even killed imitating their favorite superhero. Some years ago, a four-year-old boy in Brooklyn died. He fell from a seventh floor window. He was, he was trying to fly like Superman. Happens all around the world. A five-year-old boy in Santiago, Chile, fell from the 10th floor of what I think was an apartment building. Yes, he, he died. He was, again, trying to be Superman. Two little boys around four years of age. They may have been brothers. Maybe they were four and five in China. Fell from the fourth floor of the building in which they lived. Uh, they dived from the window, actually, their arms outstretched, wanting to fly just like Superman flies. Predictable outcome, one of them died. Very sad. Today, there's an endless parade of superheroes. It seems like they're everywhere. Superhero movies are incredibly popular. They are among the, the, the most popular movies that have ever been produced and released. What is it that people are so fascinated with superheroes? Stories like the one about the, the man who was bitten by a radioactive spider and developed spider-like superhuman abilities. Or stories like the one about the woman who was sculpted from clay. She was granted life by the Olympian gods, the Greek gods, and she came to possess an array of magical powers. Uh, what's fascinating about Wonder Woman is if you look, and maybe I shouldn't even tell you to do this, but if you, if you look into the lives of her creators, you see they were there's some weird stuff going on there, and it helps explain some of what they wrote into their Wonder Woman story. Nothing Christian about that. I wouldn't recommend it to be consumed by any believer in Jesus. Don't tell me it's harmless. It wasn't written to be harmless. Then, of course, there's Superman born on the planet Krypton, adopted by two human parents. Uh, then he, he later developed superhuman abilities, great abilities. He could fly. He was incredibly strong. He possessed X-ray vision. In one Superman movie, he even made the world spin backwards, and so on and so on. It's really interesting when you come to Superman that the, the creators of Superman connected the Superman story with the story of Jesus, superhuman, from a place far away raised by two human parents. In the beginning, Superman's earthly mother's name was Mary. His original name was Kal El. The El part is from Hebrew, Elohim. It means God, very deliberately put there. His father was Jai or Jal El or some such thing. There's no mistake about this. He was Superman, the son of a god. It's interesting that the comic book writers would go to the Bible to find their inspiration in certain places. The Superman stuff appeals to people. The whole superhero universe appeals to people. There's the, the fantasy of it all. 
And then there are people fascinated with the idea of having superhuman abilities, able to bend steel, deflect bullets. Maybe it's a chance for the average Joe to imagine himself or herself to be more than he or she is. Maybe. But we know that we live in a planet that is awash in superhuman superhero stories. However, we are just humans. We cannot fly. No one possesses a magnificent suit of armor. We can't beat all the bad guys and so on and so on and so on. We are just what we are. But then you come to the Bible, and it's there that you discover everyday people doing superhuman, extraordinary things. The story of Samson, not fantasy, that's real. Samson, who carried off the gates to a city. Samson, who killed all those people with the jawbone of a donkey. Samson, how about Elijah? He went 40 days on the strength of one meal. Elisha raised a child from the dead. Peter and John healed a lame man. Prophets who were able to foretell the future. Fascinating story early in 2 Kings about the prophet who was able to warn the king as to where the enemy were going to be. And the enemy said, we've got a traitor in the camp. There's someone telling those characters where we are at all times. Oh, no, it's not a traitor. It's the prophet of God. God is communicating this stuff. Jesus raised the dead, multiplied a little boy's lunch, turned water into wine or juice more appropriately, healed the sick. This was Jesus. And remember, Jesus was a man as he walked this earth. Now, these weren't superpowers in the mystical, fantastical, fantasy, comic book sense. Not at all. This was power, but it had a spiritual, a special divine origin. And I want to tell you this and I don't want you to be amazed, that same power is available to you. And I mean it, the power to raise the dead, heal the sick, work miracles, to prophesy, that same power is available to you. And if God wants you to have it at any point in time, he will make sure you have that power. God intends for it to be uh, that way. You tell the future, yes, if God wills. Heal the sick, yes, raise the dead, yes, Work miracles, yes. Cause an axe head to float, yes. Walls to come down, sure. But don't be surprised. God has an even greater power for you than any of those. Let me introduce you to a special group of people. It may be God's will for you to stand with this group and in this group. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1, it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him, 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Who are the 144,000? You learn pretty quickly. They are a group of people who stand with Jesus. They've triumphed over the beast and his image. They did not receive the mark of the beast. They did receive the seal of the living God. This indicates that these are the people alive and on the earth when Jesus comes, they are ready to go to heaven. It says, Father's name in their forehead. So, do they all have Yahweh inscribed right here on there? No, of course they don't. This represents God's character that's being, re uh, that's being developed in, their, in them. They've become like Christ. Jesus is seen in their lives. There's no tattoo. This is symbolic language. They're standing on a mountain with a lamb. No, they're with Jesus. That's who they are with. Now, somebody's going to ask me, does that mean the number 144,000 is symbolic? Sure it does. Otherwise, you are imagining it as just 144,000 celibate Jewish men comprising the 144,000. No, that's not so. These are overcomers, a group of people that have surrendered their lives to Jesus, a group of people that God wants you to be in or to strive to be in, to yield your heart to Jesus, looking forward to being in that group, ready to meet Jesus when he comes back. Are these superheroes? No, we wouldn't call them that. Do they have a special power? No, they don't. They really don't. And I may, I may run the risk of contradicting myself here, but you hang in there with me and you'll see just what I mean. Revelation 6 asks the question, who shall be able to stand right at the end of chapter 6? Revelation 7, next page, answers the question, who shall be able to stand, by introducing you to the 144,000. 
Those who stand with Jesus, receive the seal of God, don't receive the mark of the beast, how do they do it? Are they more special than anybody else? No, they're not. Revelation 14 verse 12 says, here is the patience of the, tell me the, saints. Here are they, two things, they do what they, they what? Keep the commandments of God, come on now, and they have the faith of Jesus. So there's the key. They have faith in Christ, or you could say the faith of Jesus. They have Jesus living in their lives and working out his life in theirs. I'd like you just to pause with me a second and ask you, what would your life look like if Jesus was living his life in you on a continual basis? Now, there are some who might not say this, but the honest answer might be, might not be a whole lot different because I'm walking with Jesus and I'm surrendering my life to him. But the rest of us, if we're going to be really honest, we might say, if I simply got into the habit of turning my life over to Jesus again and again and again and continued to yield, and whenever decision time came, I handed it to Jesus, and whenever I came to a fork in the road of my life, I listened for Jesus' direction, we might say, our lives would be very, very different. And that's what God wants for us, to be growing and growing and growing and yielding to Jesus more and receiving more of him. As John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease the 144,000 faith of Jesus that's what makes the difference but let's zero in a little more Jesus died rose from the dead and went to heaven and yet the Bible talks about Jesus living his life in us how does that happen 2,000 years after Jesus ascended to heaven Come on, now we go to John chapter 15, verse 1. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Let's take this further. It's a beautiful passage. Verse 4, he said, abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. You see that picture? Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, or she now, and I in him, or, or her, bears much fruit. Listen to this statement. For without me, you can do, tell me, nothing. Boy, we got to get that into our heads, don't we? Without Jesus, we can do nothing. He goes on to say, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done unto you. Wow, that's powerful. This is the, the wonder of the gospel. Paul described the mystery of the gospel in Colossians 1 and verse 27 as, listen, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's Christianity, and that's what God offers all of us. If you've been trying to be good, stop it right now. If you have been struggling to get to heaven, quit that. That doesn't help. Your role is to yield and let Jesus come into your life and surrender, and you get to a, an aspect in your life. I surrender that to you, Jesus. I surrender my words, my thoughts, my relationships, my actions. I surrender it to you, and you keep on doing that so that it's more of Jesus and less of you. That's the gospel at work in your life. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 24. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he, that's Jesus in him or her, and by this we know that he abides in us. Here we are now. By the, tell me, spirit whom he has given us. That's how Jesus abides or dwells in us now. First John chapter 4, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us. Because he has given us of his spirit. The role of the Holy Spirit is to bring into your life the personal presence of Jesus. Now, I don't want you to say that the Holy Spirit is Jesus. No. The Godhead is comprised of or comprises three separate individuals, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They're separate. 
different entities, but they comprise one God. And I would love to be able to take all the mystery out of that. You would be asking me to describe God, to distill God down into some little thing. I can't do that. I can tell you what the Bible says for eternity. We may be wrapping our heads around that. God is great and vast. His thoughts are above our thoughts as the heaven is as high above the earth. That's what the Bible says. So we can understand the Father, the Son, the Spirit, three, and the three are one. And the Spirit brings the presence of Jesus into your life. The Spirit of God is given to us for a multiplicity of very, very important reasons. You are going to want to have either the Spirit or more of the Spirit than you have ever had. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. If I don't go away, the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Next verse says, and when he has come, when, he had, when the Spirit of God has come, here's what he'll do. He will convict or convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And then Jesus went on to say, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Don't miss that. A significant role of the spirit of almighty God is to guide you into all truth. Now, I want to say this gently, but I do want to say it. You'll find whole denominations, their whole, their whole thing is the Holy Spirit. Great manifestations and miracles and so forth. Well, amen. But the Holy Spirit's role isn't to guide you into an ecstatic experience. You may get that. If the Lord blesses you with that, thank him for it. But if you've got a whole denomination that rests on the Holy Spirit and his power, don't you think that Holy Spirit would be guiding that denomination into all truth? How can you have a denomination crowing about the importance of the Holy Spirit for decades or even maybe hundreds of years and still can't figure out that we ought to keep all ten of the commandments of God? The Spirit of God, I would expect, would utter that in your ear if you're listening. And, and, and so I wonder about this. Let's keep this in mind. The Spirit of Almighty God will bring you into all truth. That's important. The Holy Spirit will give you power to withstand temptation, power to resist sin, and ability to follow in God's way, to live a life that is pleasing to God. You will grow. Spirit of God will help you grow. Paul wrote to the Philippians, and he said these powerful words, it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. This is where the Spirit of God leads you, so that God's will is being done in your life. If you were to have this gift, the Holy Spirit, wouldn't that be something? God would be speaking about sin, righteousness, judgment to come, guiding you into all truth. You would be growing, consistently growing. I'm not trying to tell you that you'd be 100% perfect other than you would be in Jesus. You'd have his righteousness. But you're going to grow and keep on growing. More of Jesus and less of you. You wouldn't be like the villain in the comic books wanting the superpower that this or that superhero had. You wouldn't need any of that. You're plugged into Jesus, and his power, his presence, his life is at work in your life. You'd be good to go with the Holy Spirit in your life. So if it's so good, so great, so powerful, and, and so, so apparently ever-present, how in the world do we get the Holy Spirit? Well, I'd like to say this first. The, the Holy Spirit isn't something you get like you go to the gas station and get a tank of gas. It's not like what you get when you go to the Piggly Wiggly and buy your loaf of bread. It's not you, you get like you have a possession. I understand if you were to argue that with me, I would say, yeah, I get your point. But in all honesty, it's the other way around. The Holy Spirit gets you. The Holy Spirit gets you. 
and starts working in your life. It's not like a possession you can tuck in your back pocket. You yield yourself to the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God will work in your life. I want to show you how simple it is to receive the Spirit of God. Luke 11, verse 13, Jesus made it plain. He said, if ye then being evil, sinners, all of us, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that pay him, to them that deserve it? Okay. How much more will your heavenly Father, next word, give, not sell, give the Holy Spirit to them that, that's all you got to do. The Bible is really clear. Listen to these words from Jesus. We go back in the same chapter, starting in verse 10. I say to you, ask, and it, next word, will be given. Seek, and you what? Will find. Knock, and it will. There's no might. There's no maybe, will be open to you. Everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, to the one who knocks, it will be open. That's very powerful stuff. Jesus went on to say this, and you can imagine there's a little humor here. I'm not saying he's out to get a laugh like a comedian, but they would have listened to this and thought this was funny. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Imagine that, your son making a sandwich out of a couple of rocks. They would have thought this was humorous. If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? If he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? This, of course, was an absurdity. No father is going to do that. Oh, one might have smiled. <laughs> That's so funny. One might have turned to his friend and said, oh, there are times I'd like to give my kid a scorpion. Maybe. I would never have said that. But maybe, and that's when Jesus said, if you're all being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give, give, give the Holy Spirit, the gift of gifts, to anyone who asks? Just as absurd as the idea of a father giving a snake for a fish, a scorpion for, what, a loaf of bread. Just as absurd as the idea that God would not give the Holy Spirit to someone who asks. He promises to lead your life. David wrote in the Psalms, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. That's God speaking. Over in the Proverbs chapter 3, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he, give me the next word, and he shall direct your paths. That's a promise. God promises to guide you. He promises to teach you. He promises to give you wisdom. He promises to strengthen you against sin. That's the work of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. In the book of Galatians, it just keeps on getting better. I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. How about that? The Spirit of God has given you so that even if you are bent, even if your practice, your habit is to pursue sin and obey it in the lusts thereof, the Bible says there's a way out of that. There's a remedy. There's power. And that is the Holy Spirit. you got a similar thought. Paul writing again to the church in Rome. He says, there is therefore... These are some of the most profound words in all of literature, man. Profound words. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Powerful. To them who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So you welcome the Spirit of God into your life. You are now being led by the Spirit. There is no condemnation. Verse 4. So that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So God is promising sinners that the righteous requirements of the law will be fulfilled in you. You're thinking right now, I can hardly think straight, let alone obey the 7th, 8th, ninth, 10 commandments. God says, I'll take care of that. Spirit of God will work a miracle in your life. A friend of mine was, was visiting a prison. He was talking to the top dog in the prison. 
This was not a great big, big prison. It wasn't maximum security, but it was a place where bad boys go. And he spoke to the, I mean, he was the, the, the he was the, whatever you call that guy. No, 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 no. He, this fellow was a prisoner, not a warden. And when I say top dog, I mean a top among the prisoners. He was the, whatever you call that guy. He was no good. That's what he was. He was no good. And my friend said to him, so how are things between you and God? He said, who? I don't believe there's a God. I got no time in my life for God. There's no God. Okay, my friend said, okay. Said, Let me ask you a question. Sure. Can you think of one time in your life when God showed up? Just one time. Was there ever a time that you saw God at work in your life? He got quiet. He thought, he said, there was this one time I was driving a stolen car. I was fleeing the police. I lost control of the car. I hit a bank. The car flew up in the air. It started to spin. I knew I was going to die. It was going to land on the roof. Pfft, squash me like a pancake. He said, while I was flying through the air, I cried out, God, save me. He said, I, he yelled it out. The car hit the ground, squashed. Anyone who's, everyone who saw that car said, no one could get out of there alive. He said, I got out without a scratch. My friend said, well, then you, you have seen God at work in your life. Maybe there is a God. And maybe if there is, he loves you and has a plan for you. That was where the conversation ended. A week later, my friend was back in that same prison. This fella came to him. He said, I've got to tell you something. Oh? He said, not long after you left last week, I got a phone call. I was offered the job of running a, a criminal gang from within the prison. You can do that. He said, oh, yeah, you can do that. He said, besides, I don't have to be much. Just needs to be known that I'm the figurehead leader of this organization. That's, that's all they really wanted. They were going to pay me a lot of money, he said. My friends just thought, man, that's not what I wanted to hear. So he said, so what did you tell them? He said, I told them, thank you for your offer. But I'm unable to accept it. Because last night, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And I'm a Christian now. Hey, how about that? You know? This is how God works. The righteous requirements of the law are now being displayed and manifest in that man's life. He's left the life of crime. He's left the life that got him in prison on multiple occasions. He's left the life that got him a reputation as a really bad guy. And now wherever he goes, he talks to people about Christ and being a Christian believer. Powerful. This is what happens when the Spirit of God is at work in your life. Now, one thing you've got to do, James wrote about this. Bible says in the book of James, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil in the Spirit's strength. And he will do what? Flee from you, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. And so you the surrender, yield. Paul wrote yield over in Romans chapter 6. Yield. Submit yourselves to God. And then you will love what he wrote to the Corinthians. You'll love this. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, to the human family. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. If that doesn't fire you up, then you need to check for a pulse. That's some very good news. God says if ever there's a temptation, he will provide you a way of escape from that temptation, and the way of escape is the same way every time. His name is Jesus who comes to you in the person of the Holy Spirit. You don't want to go a day an hour, a minute, even a second without knowing that the Holy Spirit is in your life. He comes to you at times when you need strength in the face of temptation. You don't need to feel alone in this world in your battle against sin when your old sinful nature drags and gets you down. God gives you his spirit to strengthen you and bless you. You want to know that. That'll give you great hope. You say, I'm not alone in this world. I'm heading to heaven. It might be a long way from here, but if I grab hold of Jesus, he's going to get me there. And so we remember, 
Ask and you shall receive. Remember, when he is coming to the world, he will reprove, convince, convict the world of sin, righteousness, judgment. It's what he does. Uh, what do you think happens when God sends the Spirit in your life? Great things. Ah, but hold on. What now do you think might happen when the Holy Spirit comes into your life and you ignore the Spirit of God's appeal to you? Or, or let me put it another way. What happens when God's Spirit speaks to your heart? You hear the voice, you know the voice, you recognize the voice, you believe this is God speaking. What happens when you ignore what the Holy Spirit says to you? You don't want to make the mistake of doing that. The Spirit of God speaks to you and you say, no, you don't want that. Uh, there are times when it is right to say no, but not to God. There are times it's right to say no to something immoral, no, unethical, no, illegal, no. It's a no. Now, you knew that already. But there are times that no is absolutely the wrong word to utter. The late Steve Jobs of Apple said something. He said, people think that focus means saying yes to the thing you've got to focus on. Fascinating quote. He said, but that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the hundred other good ideas that you are. He went on to say that the success of Apple wasn't in all of the yeses that they said, but in the no's that they said. He said, I'm actually as proud of the things that we haven't done as the things that we have done. So he said, there are times the best thing you can say is no. Warren Buffett once said, the difference between successful people and very successful people is that very successful people say no to almost everything. Parents often need to say no to children. Bosses sometimes need to say no to employees and vice versa. There are times an employee needs to say no to, to management, uh, employees, pick, pick, <laughs> pick your moment. You know, you want to misinterpret that. I'd like you to pick that thing up. Well, Bradshaw said at Revelation Today, the Great Reset, there are times I've got to say no, so <laughs> do it yourself. Yeah, the unemployment got longer by one. Oh, unemployment line just got longer by one. 15 or 20 years ago, a CEO said no to Walmart. I was really interested by this. Now, for manufacturers, Walmart is the promised land. If you can get your product in there, I mean, you're home and hosed. But this one company knew that Walmart was not the place for them. This is what happened. Now, the CEO knew that what happens in Walmart's ecosystem is this. They get you, sure. They want you to make your product cheaper. That's why some companies make the real version and then the Walmart version, because they can't sell the real version to Walmart at a profit, so they make the Walmart version, and it's a little cheaper. That's how they get around it. So Walmart will squeeze you on price. You lower your price. You start to sell more, but it's at a reduced rate. Then they squeeze you more. And what happens then is that you've got to... You've got to outsource production. Maybe you've got to send production overseas. Your standards almost invariably go down. And then they're going to squeeze you more. You start laying off staff. See? You end up getting into a death spiral. Not every company, but some companies, they get into this death spiral. Now, this company happened to be snapper mowers. And my father-in-law once had a snapper mower, but it wasn't his. It was his mother's, I guess it was his father's, the thing was as old as dirt. And you pull the cord, vroom, it roars to life as though you just brought it home the day before. And no, I, I'm not taking a kickback from Snapper. I'm just telling you my experience with these things. I don't own one now. So Snapper mowers sold 80% of their stuff through distributors. But they were a little expensive. Uh, you can go to the, to the big box store and buy a mower for 100 bucks, 150 bucks, and it's great if it lasts a season, good for you. Uh, it doesn't cost you much, and it's essentially disposable, really. You, you, you can get them that cheap, is what I'm saying. But not the snapper mower. You've got to pay, at least you used to have to pay a whole lot more, but the whole idea was we'll look after you, we will help you, and we'll service the thing, and, and you've got a product that's going to last you for life. Now, Walmart said to Snapper, we want to go head to head with Lowe's and Home Depot. And we're going to build this whole thing around Snapper products. 
But you know, Snapper products were, were, were never cheap. In order to thrive at Walmart, they'd have to get cheap. And that they knew just wasn't going to fly. He said, that's not what we want to do with our company. He said, thank you, but no. And he walked out of Walmart, having lost 20% of their business just like that, because Walmart sold 20% of everything Snapper sold. But he felt like if he kept going in that direction, over and the company would be dead before too long. Was it the right decision? I don't know. I don't know, Snapper has changed hands a couple of times since then. Maybe it was right, maybe it was not. But he knew there were times you gotta say no. We know that sometimes you gotta say no. But you don't wanna say no to God. When God speaks to your heart, what do you do? Jesus spoke to some fishermen one day, follow me. They followed, left their nets. See you, Dad. We got to go. Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler one day. The rich young ruler said, so, so how do I get eternal life? Jesus said, pretty simple. Sell your stuff. Give your money to the poor. Follow me. You have everlasting life. I, I, I've never heard it said quite like that in the Bible, if I, if I, as I think right now. Jesus told the man, if you do this, you'll go to heaven one day. And the man said, if I do that, I'm not going to do it. And he said to Jesus, no. He had many goods. The unfortunate thing was his goods were his gods. And by the way, Jesus does not ask everybody to sell all their stuff. He doesn't ask everybody to do that. But he does ask us all to leave it all on the altar dedicated to Jesus at all times. And this man couldn't do that. He said no to Jesus. And when you get to heaven, and I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt right now, you will not find that particular rich young ruler. He would have died, based on what we know in the Bible, a lost man. Who were the wise ones? The earthy fishermen, who I imagine knew how to turn the air blue with their cursing. Peter certainly did. He did that the night he betrayed Jesus. Or the rich young ruler, who was pretty sophisticated and probably ran with a good crowd and no doubt had the finer things in life. The answer is obvious who the wise one was. I want to ask you, though, which one are you? Would you be one of the fisher folk listening to Jesus and then following? Or would you be the rich young ruler saying, I don't know. Listen to this. This is Jesus speaking. It's in Matthew chapter 12. He says, therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. That's interesting. Anyone who speaks a word against the son of man, it'll be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. Now, what's fascinating is we know that God is willing to forgive all sin. You, Lord, are good and ready to forgive. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We know that God will forgive. But here, the Christ says there's a sin that's unpardonable. How could it be unpardonable? When Peter was preaching at Pentecost in Jerusalem, a few weeks earlier, Jesus had died. The Holy Spirit was present speaking to the people's hearts, and they sensed the Holy Spirit speaking to them. It says in Acts 2, verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They said to Peter, to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? The answer came back, and this is what it was. Repent. And let every one of you be, tell me, be baptized. That was tepid, so we'll do it again. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Spirit of God comes to you and speaks. It'll say, go left, go right. The Spirit of God will say, no, no, or yes. The Spirit of God will say, stand up, sit down. You understand what I mean? And I don't mean that in a, in a silly, do I stand or do I sit sort of a thing, but the Spirit of God will give you direction, particularly in your spiritual life. So what happens when the Holy Spirit calls, speaks, convicts, and you say, no? What then? When God speaks and you say, no, it works a little bit like hitting the snooze button on the alarm clock. You get a few minutes peace, and then, then it comes back again. But you know, you can hit the snooze button Often enough, you can get to the place that you can sleep through an alarm because you, you just don't respond to it. And so when it 
sounds, you no longer hear it. It's like, like children, you know. Hey, uh, why don't you get, get out from in front of that TV and come out here and do the dishes. Okay. They're not really listening. They're engrossed. And after a while, you can call a kid who's just not hearing you because the child is watching the television or, or whatever it might be. Not hearing you anymore. We can be like that with God. It says in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4 and verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Isn't that something? We can grieve the Spirit of God. James wrote about the same thing. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. You don't want to grieve the Spirit of God. You're not a wound, turn back, repel the Spirit of Almighty God. When you know to do good and you don't do it, that's sin. That's sinning by not doing anything, right? By omitting to do, to surrender, to yield to the will of God. So if it's time to make something right about your experience, now's the time to do it. There's no compelling reason ever that you should wait to repent, wait to follow God, wait to make a decision, wait to get your life right. There's no good reason. If you wait a week, the devil will turn that week into a month the month into a year, the year into a lifetime, and your eternal life will be turned into eternal damnation because way back here somewhere, you said no to God and no and no and no to God. Of course, God is good enough. You said no, he came back. You said no, he came back again. You you resisted him. The Spirit of God didn't give up. But eventually, God gets the message. I don't want to hear from you anymore. And God says, all right, that's that, that would be your... That would be your will then, and what's God going to do other than honor your will? Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, told them not to quench the Spirit of God. Don't pour cold water on the Spirit of God. Many do. Great idea. I will follow God. I will obey him. I will certainly get around to that. Miracle of miracles. It doesn't always work out that way because you don't have to say no to God. You could just say, not now. You could say, wait. You could say, later, God. And what do you, God is a gentleman. He doesn't kick the door down. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, it says in the book of Revelation. He doesn't barge in, drag you kicking and screaming off to heaven. No, he hangs on the cross, as it were, and he says, do do you see the love that I have for you? And you say, oh, yes, I want to follow that Savior. And so he says, follow me. And you you can't follow without getting up and moving forward. You you don't follow at a great distance. Peter did that. If he'd been standing at Jesus' side and said, I'm with him. You know what would have happened? Would it have cost him his life? Probably not. It was only Jesus on trial. But he wouldn't have denied Jesus. And he wouldn't have lost all that. And he wouldn't be known today as the fellow who said no to Jesus. Oh, I'll wait. You'll do what? As though you have a tomorrow? Who who promised you tomorrow? Nobody. Not even God. That's why the Bible says, today while you hear his voice, harden not your heart. I mean, some of us are living on borrowed time. Some of us have been through difficult experiences in our life. Some of us are, to use a worldly phrase, just flat out lucky to be here. And we're going to ask God to just hold on until I have a a better moment or until it makes more sense or until, I I mean, what? Until what? Until what? There is no no good moment to say to God, I'm going to wait. I'll give up that sin, but I'll give it up later. Or I'll make this thing right in my life, but at another time. Or I'll begin to keep all the commandments of God when my family agrees and we're all going to do this thing together. While you're getting around to it, the devil is inventing unnumbered schemes to keep you from doing the will of God. Hit the pause button. I'll wait. And that's suddenly from out of the blue. Your brother-in-law shows up, and he's got 50 reasons why you shouldn't obey God. And you don't necessarily feel like you're convinced, but he's made you stop and think, and you're scratching your head. The devil lines up somebody else, and somebody else, and somebody at the church offends you. And now, I'm done. Truth never changed. Jesus never changed, but you allowed the devil to get a hold of your heart. I want to encourage you not to do that. You don't want to give the devil even a toehold, because if you do, you've heard it said, hit, turn it into a foothold, and before long, it becomes a stronghold. You don't want that. When you tell God no, it is then that you are on the pathway to committing the unpardonable sin. That's just the truth. 
The Holy Spirit calls you to follow Jesus. You say no. So what are you doing? You're making it harder for the Spirit of God to get through to you. You're, you're making it harder for the Spirit of God to get through to you. It's just like so many things in this world. The first time you saw that, tried that, heard that, oh my, that was shocking. But now it happens, it doesn't even make you flinch. You just got used to whatever that thing was. Same as saying no to the Spirit of God. God calls you. You got my attention, but you wait, you tarry, you linger, and you dice with death. It may well be the time is coming and you are not going to hear that voice speaking to your heart again, and you want to. The Holy Spirit calls. You say no. You're saying wait. You're pushing God away. Why would you do that? The Bible says in the book of Romans, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And you don't get left with your arms folded and your seat, uh, sorry, you don't get led with your arms folded and your seat on your chair and your legs crossed and a complete disinclination to yield to Jesus. That's not being led. David said in the Psalms, this ought to wake us up. Do not cast your, uh, sorry, do not cast me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. This is his prayer of repentance. He knew that if he carried on in sin, the Spirit of God would no longer be extended to him. Back in Genesis, prior to the flood, God said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. That's why God gave 120 years. And then after Noah's preaching was done and the ark was completed, God shut the door and those on the outside were irrevocably on the outside, could never get on the inside, even though there was another week with no rain. You can imagine them partying on the outside, ridiculing Noah, banging on the ark. You can imagine that. And they were lost. My spirit will not always strive. I'm going to preach to these people 120 years. I will communicate with them 120 years. After that, probation closed. They will have not a moment or a day longer. The unpardonable sin, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, ascribing to the devil the works of God. You can extrapolate that from the Bible very clearly. The unpardonable sin isn't a particular sin. It's not a kind of sin. It's a condition in sin. Someone say, is it murder? No, Moses was a murderer. He's already in heaven. One of the very few taken to heaven. He was raised from his sleep and taken to heaven. All right then, is the unpardonable sin blasphemy? Well, I don't think so. We don't know exactly what Peter said, but I don't think it was savory stuff. And Peter, we know, died a saved man. He was forgiven. Is the unpardonable sin adultery? No, 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 that's David. Uh, he, he breached that one on numerous occasions, but he was forgiven by God. Didn't mean it wasn't serious. He was merely forgiven, that's all. You could run on through all the sins that you could think of, and you'll find somebody in the Bible who has done that or something very close to it. No, the unpardonable sin, the thing that God won't forgive, is the one he cannot forgive because you won't confess it. It could be something small in your mind. But when you say no to God, God says, I'd like that, please. I want to take that from you and give you a new heart. And you say no... You've just chosen that as your God before God. You're violating the first commandment. No other gods is before me. When the Spirit of God speaks to your conscience and you know, and God says, come now, and you say, mm, not happening. You've put that between you and God. He can't forgive that. You don't confess it. You don't yield it. You hang on to it. You cling to it. You distance yourself from God. Eventually, he's talking to you about it, but you're not listening. And you're not going to be able to hear the voice of Almighty God. You shut out the voice calling you to repentance. You're on the way to committing the unpardonable sin, and eventually it's done. When we choose not to follow the Lord, and not to follow, and not to yield, and not to surrender, there comes a time when we don't hear his voice and we've committed the unpardonable sin. I've met people, and more than likely so of you, maybe we're even believers, got stuck in some kind of sin or selfishness, and they said no to God, and today you speak to them, and you might as well be speaking to a stone wall. 
Nothing gets in. They just locked God out, and God moved on. He said they've, they've chosen their fate. They're just as lost as lost. The unpardonable sin is whatever you won't give to God. The unpardonable sin is whatever you won't yield. That's the unpardonable sin. You don't want to hang on to anything that God is trying to take away. You don't want to cling to something that God would, would he wants to move into that area of your life. Could be an attitude, could be a thought, a disposition. When God says, surrender, when God says, I'm calling you to follow, to resist is to step down that road to committing the unpardonable sin. God can forgive you worshiping graven images. He can forgive you not honoring your mother and your father. But he can't forgive what you don't want to have forgiven. He cannot forgive what you don't yield to him. And whatever that thing is becomes for you the unpardonable sin. When God calls to you, you want to act immediately and without delay. I want to show you the unpardonable sin in progress. We go to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 24. It says, after some days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith of Christ. Now as he, Paul, reasoned about righteousness, temperance, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and he answered. One version says he trembled and he said, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. It doesn't suit me right now. Later, when I feel better about it, when I feel comfortable with it, I will call you when it works better for me. Why in the world? Who knows when it works better for you? You or God? God knows. God knows. That's, that's why you're here. God knew this was the time you needed to be uh, thinking about the Bible, learning new things from the Word of God, having the opportunity to repent and surrender. God knew. God knows. And here's, here's this brother with the temerity to say, doesn't suit me right now. I'll call for you later. It's fascinating. The Bible makes no record of him ever calling for Paul and saying, I'm ready now. Because he never was. The man died lost. If you're on the inside of the city, look out to the crowd, you'll see him out there. You say, man, you should be in here. You had the opportunity. You, you listened to Paul. You listened to Paul. Not even, that, not even that was enough. In Acts chapter 26, Paul is now speaking to King Agrippa. And he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Didn't wait for an answer. I know you do. I could say the same to you. You believe the Bible? No, ah, don't tell me. I know you do. You believe the word of God? Sure, you believe the word of God. You believe what we've read in the Bible? 100% you do. There's no question about it. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight pitiful words. Almost you persuade me to be a Christian. Almost. He was almost persuaded, friend, and he was totally lost. So how is it with you tonight? Are you almost, almost persuaded? Well, I don't want you to be almost persuaded. God does not either. He would wish that you would be completely persuaded and say, I'm going to follow Christ. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. You don't want to be like the people in the story Jesus told. He invited people to a feast, and, and one of them said, I just bought some land. i got to go see my land. Another one said, I just bought five yoke of oxen. got to go test my oxen. Another one said, I just got married. i got to spend some time with my wife. We were all too busy to come to the feast. They were all just excuses. Why would you say no to the one who invites you to the great supper? That does not make any sense at all. This is why Jesus said, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. He didn't say, hey, take your time. He said, come to me. Jesus said, all who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. If you come, I won't reject you. No matter your baggage or your background, I won't regret you. You might be the woman at the well, the woman taken in adultery. You might be wicked Manasseh who sacrificed his own children to the devil by burning them in fire. And Manasseh died a saved man, I promise you. If God could save Manasseh, God could save you. 
There is going to be a great feast one day, a great supper one day, and God is inviting you to be there and not to miss it. Greatest invitation you ever had was the invitation to be saved, and God is not going to force your hand. He'll speak to your heart. He will draw you. He will, he will woo you. He said in Hosea, I will speak comfortably to her and allure her. Beautiful words, but he won't force you. He's a gentleman. He won't do that. In the book of Hebrews, God asks a searching question. How shall we be saved if we neglect so great salvation? And you notice he didn't say, if we reject. No one, you don't have to flat out reject God. You could go to church, sing in the choir. But that's not the same as surrendering to Jesus and following where he leads you. If we don't surrender, how can we be saved? Answer is simple. We cannot. Are you wrestling over doing the will of God? I hope you're not. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what? Simple, isn't it? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Are you hesitating about being baptized? Telling God no when, when Jesus already said yes to you. If you are, why are you? When Ananias spoke to Saul, Saul who became Paul, he said, why tarriest thou? Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Jesus is coming back soon. We had a series of meetings just like this. Jeremy, and I did not even know his name, came to us early in the series of meetings. He said, I'd like to be baptized. We said, that's great. We have a baptism taking place, or probably in a couple of weeks. Jeremy said, no, I need to be baptized tomorrow night. It was oddly specific. Jeremy, what's up? He said, the following morning, I go to jail must spend some time in jail. It wasn't a day either. It was time. He said, I have turned myself in. I need to repay or pay my debt to society. It's the right thing to do. So I want to be baptized. I'll never forget Jeremy standing in the water. He said, can I say something? Oh, sure. He spoke to everybody in the congregation. Was hundreds of people he said I've gone through some stuff in my life particularly after my little brother died everything kind of spun out of control I lost about everything I had he said I'm going to jail soon but I cannot go into jail without surrendering my life to Jesus I have to be baptized and by the way if you're wondering how the story plays out Jeremy came out of jail in one piece it's just fine got involved in church he is the pastor's right-hand man at the church he attends. He's, he's in up to here with Jesus. But it's what he said that impressed me so much. He spoke to the congregation and he said, I want to encourage you not to wait. This comes from Jeremy, not me. I want to encourage you not to wait. If God is calling you, don't wait. Be baptized. Give your life to Jesus. It was a powerful little sermon. I'll never forget it. And it lives on as I get to share it with you right here and right now. If God is calling you, don't wait. Don't wait. Tell God, I want to find out more about baptism. I want to be baptized. I want to rededicate my life to Christ through rebaptism, if that's what's going on in your life. I've been wondering about keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. Now, I know I want to keep all of the Ten Commandments, not nine, not eight, ten. By the grace of God, you would be saying tonight, I'm not going to say no to the Holy Spirit. I'm here to invite you to give your life to Jesus. It's just that simple. If you've done so and it's time to rededicate your life and say, God, I'm following, now is the time for you to come. Again, if you're standing there thinking everything is good between God and I, I know the message, I'm okay, then your thing is to stand and pray. 
You might want to encourage somebody. Yeah, you go to Jesus tonight. If you're not here, but you're viewing by some technologically marvelous way, text me, would you? 71392. Let me check my number. Hasn't changed. 71392. Text me the word decide. That's the message you send me. Send me that message, decide. Type it in, decide. I send you a link. Click the link, then you decide. So decide to decide and then decide. Would you do that? Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we come to you grateful. Grateful you've called, and we are responding, answering. We don't have much to bring you. There's not a one of us who would claim superiority or righteousness of our own. So we claim Jesus. We thank you for his righteousness. And we accept him. I want to pray for each person who've come to the, who has come to the front tonight that you would, when they go, send them from here with a, a very real, rich sense of your assurance and saving grace. You remind them, they came to Jesus tonight in a, in a meaningful way. They expressed that. It's like they walk through a door that's closed behind them. Remind them they stand with you. They've stood at the cross. They've accepted Jesus. He claims them as his own. There are some to be baptized. We look forward to that. Some who are, all who are growing in your grace. We thank you for that. And now, O oh God, let your benediction rest upon us. Your spirit fill us. Work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. And if there's somebody here, wherever here might be, who has just thought, ah, no, I won't, I can't, I, I have to wait. Well, I thank you, Lord. You are gracious and merciful. You go after that person. Speak to that heart. Draw that one so that that person will experience heaven's peace sooner, fully, rather than later and partially, if at all. Bless us, Lord, we pray. Thank you again for these dear ones who've come. We lift them up to you. Put your arms around them. Station angels around them. Uh, fill them with your spirit in a mighty and a powerful way. Give them a testimony to bear, a witness, a ministry. Use them for your glory. But Lord, take away all doubt, all uncertainty. We're looking to Jesus. His death was for us, his resurrection for us, his ministry in heaven right now for us. We have everything to be thankful for, and so we do thank you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Please say with me, amen.